Welcome, everyone. Uh, very excited to have you here and to have uh, such an esteemed uh, panel of speakers. Um, so the first thing I'll say, I will like to recognize that many uh, university staff in the UK are on strike today. Uh, we did originally plan this uh, workshop to be tomorrow, the 16th, which was then called as a strike day. We moved it to the 15th to avoid the, the strike in the UK, but then today was called as a strike day as well. But by that time, we had too many people signed up. So we're going ahead with it today, but we do recognize that that many colleagues in the UK are on strike. And this, as Will said, this is being recorded. And so uh, I, we hope that uh, UK colleagues will be able to, to watch that if they can't attend today. So. Without further ado, um, I'm just going to say a very few words to start up. As Will said, we've got a very packed agenda, um, which looks roughly like this. Uh, so we're going to hear from uh, Ian Raskovich uh, from PLOS, uh, talking about publishers and uh, in particular PLOS. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, David Moha and Delwyn Franzen about indicators in the health sciences and from Marie Tukari and Jan Polonen from Finland on um, uh, developments in Finland and across Europe. Uh, we'll also we'll then take a break, a well-earned break, I think, before we hear from, from Rachel on a funder perspective and from Emma from an institutional perspective about the sorts of considerations that uh, might occur to, to funders and to institutions with respect to open research indicators. And then there will be a little time for a panel discussion. So please, as we're going through, store up your questions for the panel. I'm sure you'll have many. Uh, we've got about half an hour then uh, before I come back and just wrap up at the end. But I would like to say a little bit about my motivation, really, for, for uh, working with all these uh, people and others to put this together. And that is the work that UKRN is, is thinking of, well, is actually, is kicking off. And if you've seen the, UK, the, the news item on the UKRN website today, you'll have some idea of what oh. it is. Um, and this is work that we're going to work with our, our institutions across the UK reproducibility network. So we've got about 20 institutions who are interested in, in working on open research indicators. And our intention is to work with them to help them plan, monitor and evaluate organisational development in support of open research. So this is not metrics for researcher or research assessment. This is using indicators to help institutions plan, monitor and evaluate organizational institutional interventions in support of open research. And so it's about planning guidance and policies. It's about planning procedures, training, support of other sorts of kinds that institutions might want to put in place and evaluate uh, to support open research. So that's the distinction that we'd like to draw. It's it's not a clear distinction that we'd like, you know, that, that can be strongly defended, but I think it's a good focus for the work that we want to do. So this is the plan that we've got as UK Reproducibility Network. You'll see we're at the top here at the 15th of March. We're launching today a call for priority needs. And um, that is a call for especially research, uh, researchers and research students in, in UK institutions to tell us which aspects of open research would do you think are the priorities that we should be monitoring, evaluating, uh, monitoring and evaluating to, to inform this organizational development, to, to help institutions plan the kinds of support they put in place for open research. So this call for priority needs is going to be really influential because it's going to give us a set of, if you like, the universe of indicators, the universe of things that we want to monitor that will then go on to uh, inform conversations that we want to have with potential solutions providers and with the pilot institutions to set up pilots in maybe 10 or 15 or 20 institutions next year uh, to test whether or not we can reliably, validly, ethically monitor, the, monitor those aspects of, a, of open research in ways that do help institutions better support open research. So that's the sort of plan, if you like. Um, we know that we need to engage quite widely on this. So the call for priority, priority needs is going out to researchers and to research students in institutions. But we know we need to talk to funders. We need to talk to publishers. 
we'll hear from both of those today and, and other projects and initiatives in this area. And so there are parts of the plan that are designed to make sure that we do exactly that. So you can read the call for, for priorities here. There's a QR code there if you want to scan it right now and go straight to it. It's also in the news item on the UKRN website. Uh, you might want to get it downloaded and skim it during the break uh, so that you've got that to hand for, uh, the, for the panel session, or you might want to read it later. And you can see here's the link to, to respond to the call for priorities. So that is just a little outline of the rationale for why, you know, why I thought it, or we as UKRN thought it was important for us to start a conversation about indicators here, but we're very, very far from being the only organization interested in this topic, as as you will have seen from the um from the lineup that we've got today. And I'm sure those are the people that you really want to hear from from. So without further ado, please could I her, uh, hand over to, to Ian Ranaskovich from PLOS to talk about the initiatives that they've been leading there. Ian. Thanks very much, Neil, for the introduction and, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to, to share this, this work that we've been doing. So I'm going to be telling you about a project that we've been working on at PLOS um, in partnership with an organization called Dataseer that um, is about a number of different things. And one of those is, is helping to give us better information on the extent to which open science is being practiced or not um, across scholarly publications. So I'm gonna tell you about our motivations for doing this in more depth, but then also share some of the results with you. Uh, a brief bit of background and context. Now, many of you may know of PLOS, Public Library of Science, and we're probably best known for publishing open access journals, enabling open access to the results of research. Uh, but our journals do a number of other things that are intended to promote and support open science practices beyond the article, beyond the results of research. Some examples are shown here. Um, back in 2014, we introduced a mandatory data sharing policy, a mandatory data availability policy. Um, we have been a strong supporter of preprint posting, early sharing of, of research, and have policies and partnerships that intend to make preprint sharing easier and more rewarding. We encourage authors to publish their peer review history. And for example, we, we've been publishing registered reports, the registered report format for, for two or three years now. Um, as well as those examples shown on this slide, there are in fact 14 at last count different aspects of open science practice beyond the article that are in one way or another supported through PLOS journal policies, features or processes. Um, back in early 2020, we um, took a strategic decision to aim to measurably increase adoption of open science practices beyond the article, because that's a beneficial thing for science and society and, and all of the reasons why open science is important, which I won't repeat now. Um, we intentionally decided to focus on a subset of those 14 open science practices. Mo like, mo like most organizations, we can't do everything all at once. So we have focused on four open science practices for the last two or three years. And those practices are, sharing of protocols, those that detailed step-by-step -step methods or instructions for conducting research. Um, secondly, sharing of code or software. Thirdly, sharing of research data with a particular focus on best practice in data sharing, that is using data repositories. And fourthly, further promoting the sharing of preprints. But of course, with any plan, with any strategy that we're spending a lot of time and energy in, it's important to know whether or not that plan's been successful um, or, or whether it's not. Uh, and to do that, we need much better information. Um, and what, we, what was pretty clear to us was that before the Open Science Indicators Project, there was no comprehensive or longitudinal or reliable enough source of information that could tell us everything that we wanted to know about um, even these four open science practices. And that problem of needing better information on open science practices, open research practices is not a unique one for PLOS. Um, I'm sharing here a couple of pieces of qualitative research that further evidence this need, this problem, 
that a lack of tools, a lack of information on the extent to which practices like data sharing and code sharing have been carried out, there is a lack of tools that is a barrier to understanding the effect of policies and, and potentially implementing them. Um, the graph on the left was um, research conducting with funding agencies in Europe. The quotes on the right are from a survey of around 120 funders and institutions that again validated that uh, monitoring aspects of open science beyond the article is challenging and, and often as illustrated by the quotes, um, people are having to result to quite manual process to try to understand these things. So we have a number of goals for the Open Science Indicators project. So it's called Open Science Indicators, the label PROS, PLOS has chosen. Um, the goals are short term and longer term. Um, so the, the, the first two are more shorter term goals. Um, as I've already signaled, we have an internal need at PLOS for better information. We want to understand um, how successful we're being or not in supporting open science, but also understanding those practices better um, will help us to understand researchers better, who are, are our customers essentially. And if we can understand where open science is being practiced, where it's not, um, then we hope to identify new opportunities, new ways to better support open science through uh, creating or co-creating co solutions with different research communities. But as this problem is not unique to PLOS, we thought it was very important to take an open science approach to the project. And so by sharing what we're doing openly, both methods and results, we hope we can at least contribute to conversations and support initiatives uh, intended to drive open science outside of PLOS. And the aspiration, I suppose, is that then collectively, we can all um, seek to increase adoption of open science globally. So how have we done it so far? Briefly, um, about 18 months ago, we did a small pilot of a new or a new to us technological approach to measuring one particular open science practice in PLOS content. That was code sharing. One of our journals had recently introduced a new policy making code sharing mandatory, and we wanted to see if it was successful or not. And a pilot of, of that approach uh, using natural language processing and artificial intelligence, working with an organization called Datasphere was successful in terms of it, it told us what we wanted to know, um, but it also showed that that policy was successful. We then took a step back and um, acknowledging that there was an opportunity here to, more, to potentially assess multiple open science practices. We went away and defined a set of broad principles to underpin this entire activity and also a, uh, a more complete set of requirements like what practices do we want to measure and, and um, what specifics of those practices were important for us to know about. After that we then uh, through a competitive uh, request for proposals process RFP if you're not familiar with that initialism um, found a partner to work on this 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 broader more ambitious project and, and that partner is uh, is Datasphere. And then in December we we released the initial set of results which, which I'll tell you a bit more about shortly. I did, before I do that, want to summarize the six principles that we set out for this entire project. And you can read them in more depth, along with the full detailed requirements um, from this DOI here. There's a white paper in, in Figshare written by, by me and, and Veronique Kirma. Um, so those principles that we set out are that in monitoring or measuring open science, we want to align with established approaches or definitions wherever possible. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So for example, the FAIR principles um, are very important in how we've, how we've defined our approach. We also, while we're mindful of and want to promote best practices, we actually, we also want to know what's happening right now, even if those might be perceived to be suboptimal uh, sharing or open science practices. We want whatever we do to be interoperable across geographies, across research disciplines. Also, whatever we do needs to be scalable. It needs to be automatable across thousands and thousands of, 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 of published papers and, and outputs. Um, the last two I've highlighted, because I think they are especially important, but the fifth one is that the results of these open science monitoring efforts, it seems like an obvious one, but they must be openly available as well. And sixthly, and I think really importantly, is about responsible use of this new source of information. Um, we're using it to understand researchers, support improvements in practices. We're not using the information to create new rankings of individuals, of institutions, or, or simply to, to, to enforce compliance. So um, 
this isn't really a big reveal. This has been on the internet for a few weeks now, but this is, I suppose, a summary of the results that we have so far in one graph. Now, I'm not going to interpret the results too much. I'm just going to show you some examples of what can be done with them so far. So in this first data release, there are three open science indicators. That's data sharing, code sharing, and preprint posting. This graph in particular focuses on data sharing in a repository, that best practice, but as I will show shortly, you can look at other modes of data sharing. The good news is the graphs are trending upwards, um, the, and that's trending upwards across the board because the solid lines are analysis of PLOS content from 2019 through to the middle of 2022 so far, and the dotted lines are analysis of non-PLOS content that's been randomized and selected from PubMed Central, but randomized in such a way that the topics of that comparator group, the not PLOS content, are matching that of the, of the PLOS content. So that's kind of overall, overall headline results. Things are trending upwards steadily. To give you a few different other examples of what can be done with the data. So I, I've mentioned that as well as looking specifically at data sharing in repositories, one can also look at overall rates of data sharing by any method, including shared and in supporting information um, and shared in ways which might not be in a repository, but might still involve sharing online on a lab notebook or, or other kind of website. So what you can see, again, overall rates of sharing are increasing. Um, there is a difference we've observed in the PLOS corpus, the blue line, compared to the comparator group, the yellow line. But you'll also note that it's not 100% in, in any case. And there are a number of reasons why that likely is. is. Um, some data can't be shared even in journals with mandatory policies because of legitimate legal or ethical restrictions. In some cases, we simply haven't detected the data sharing because the, these processes do involve metadata. And, and, and as we know, that, that can sometimes be a challenge. We might also have cases of non-compliance with policies, but are, in, particularly in the case of comparatives, we may have journals that simply don't have a mandatory policy. So we, would, we certainly wouldn't expect um, very high levels of data sharing in those cases. Another example of what can be done with the data and I, uh, something that's quite important in terms of the approach that I would like to call out. So the, the headline graph that I showed had rates of code, data and preprint sharing as a function or as a proportion of all articles published. But um, for a practice like code sharing, that's actually only applicable to a subset of research studies, a subset of published research papers. While the vast majority of papers, particularly in PLOS journals, generate data, they're based on data in terms of what they're analyzing, what they're publishing, that is not true for something like code sharing. And what the technology enables us to do is to not just look at what is being shared, but actually identify what could be shared. So it will tell us which papers are generating code or using scripts. And those um, give quite different results depending on broad subject areas. So for example, in public health and medicine, just under half of PLOS papers appear to be generating code, but in something like computational biology, we're getting close to 100%, which is, is perhaps obvious, but it really helps us understand where open science practices or policies might actually be relevant. And then of course, what the graph is showing, if you actually plot code sharing as a proportion of those papers which actually have code to share, then you tend to see higher results than looking at papers overall. Um, last one or two slides, I think now, um, just to show you another example and another indicator. So this is preprint sharing. So as I've signaled already, those rates are increasing steadily um, across the literature. Um, but what we can also do with uh, the data, if we, if we choose to, is to look at how things might differ between different regions as well as different subject areas. Um, so what we can see here is if you are particularly interested in what's happening in the UK with respect to preprints or any of the indicators, we can see, for example, that the UK appears to have a, a higher rate of preprint adoption than the, 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 than the average that we can see overall. Now, we, we're not um, using this information to compare institutions or funders, but in principle and in practice, that is possible if, if you know which particular papers one is looking for. And in fact, there has already been an analysis of a particular institution's um, 
adoption of these indicators by someone independent from PLOS, Robin Price at Imperial, has published a blog uh, reusing the data set, thinking about um, the indicators in, in their context, which is quite exciting to see that reuse. So final slide from me um, in terms of what, what's next. Um, I mean, you can access the data. Again, QR codes are available if you know how to use them. It's in Figshare, just search PLOS Open Science Indicators. So what we're doing now is we're receiving feedback from the community on what we should do next, the methods we've used, how they could be improved. We're going to be releasing new data sets every quarter. So the next one covering data through to the end of 2022 should be out by the end of this month. And then in terms of what's what's next really is you tell us um, what indicators you're interested in, how could it support other efforts? You know, I acknowledge we're not going to solve everybody's problems with with this particular data set, but um, by intentionally being open with how we're how we're doing things, sharing the data, sharing the methods, um, we hope to be a, at least a part of the conversations that, that are happening. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see events like this doing so. Thank you. Fantastic, Ian. Thank you so much. That is so exciting to see the work that PLOS is doing there. Um, so, yeah, please uh, note down your questions for the panel. Um, we're probably going to have to move straight on now, so no time for questions for Ian at the moment, but we can come back to him later on. So at this point, I'd like to, to move and ask David Moore from the Centre for Genealogy to, to pick up and talk to us a little bit about indicators, in particular in the health sciences. Thanks very much, um, Neil, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and uh, share our, our work with you today. Um, I have just sort of um, highlighted here that uh, exactly a year ago today, um, we had a consensus meeting on open science dashboard for, for biomedicine. So it's, uh, it's, it's timely that we are, um, uh, back here today, so it's an opportunity to present uh, to present some of this work uh, more more fully. Um, our remit was to uh, establish a core set of open science practices to monitor using a, an automated dashboard um, within uh, a sort of biomedical institutions. Um, in a sense, there's sort of two um, uh, possible approaches um, here. Uh, the first approach is the Islagat, <laughs> which is the, uh, it seems like a good idea at the time. And so um, you, basically, you know, I always use the analogy of uh, sort of the, the movie Field of Dreams. It, it seems to me that, um, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, you know, lots of development um, uh, has gone on in, in this way. The other approach that I think um, we leaned uh, more towards was a, uh, a, a user-based design where we sought out um, end user input as to what a dashboard uh, could look like and what sort of elements um, are they interested in, in collecting. And so, um, I think that's the uh, approach that um, we uh, ended up taking. Um, all of this work, uh, which has been led by uh, Peli Kobe, who's on uh, parental leave at the moment, um, has been led, as I said, by Kelly and a, a, large, a large group of uh, folks from uh, many different institutions. Uh, also, of course, um, uh, want to recognize, welcome, uh, without their funding, we would not have been able to um, uh, to do this work. So I'm going to obviously only speak for a few minutes. And so if people want uh, more details about uh, everything that we've done, I would encourage you to uh, look at this uh, plus biology paper, which is um, uh, earlier from earlier this year. So we included um, a convenience a sample, uh, we snowballed that sample. We uh, basically took, uh, uh, we're looking for people from sort of four different stakeholder groups, uh, scholarly communications, research administrators, leaders, um, within um, uh, academic institutions, 
uh, folks who are involved in uh, research assessments, pr promotion and tenure committees, and institutional staff um, who are involved in, in research or assessment. Um, so you can see here um, on, on, on the right side, uh, we had folks from several different uh, countries involved in, in, in our effort, and also from uh, several different um, stakeholder groups. Uh, as I indicated previously, <clears throat> we used a, a user-centered design in our indicator development. We uh, did uh, really three rounds of modified Delphi's. And I, I think most people in, in the audience are probably familiar with what Delphi studies are. In, in round one, we uh, had 80 participants and uh, we had uh, 56 participants in round two. And then round three was a, a virtual uh, meeting as I indicated earlier. Uh, and we had um, approximately uh, 20 people over, uh, over day one and day two. So um, <clears throat> now to the punchline is that um, we, we came up with um, uh, 19 um, different indicators and um, we asked uh, uh, we asked the audience to um, uh, to rank um, their preference for seeing these indicators recorded and so um, um, for example the the top ranked one was um, uh, registration for clinical trials uh, and then you can obviously read as well as I can um, in um, in the uh, top 12, which is the traditional open science practices, you can see uh, there's some um, uh, sort of common ones. Uh, for example, Ian had um, discussed uh, preprints and we also see it um, in, in our top 12. We can also see a study code. Again, this is um, um, what Ian mentioned. And here we have also registration for systematic uh, systematic reviews. Um, in, in terms of what the uh, respondents um, would like to see um, in, in terms of broader transparency practices, uh, we also asked the uh, respondents to rank those. Um, some of them um, are perhaps expected, uh, author contributions described, uh, conflict of interest, uh, reporting whether ORCID uh, identifiers were used and, um, for example, uh, also reporting whether data code materials are shared um, with a clear uh, license. So you, you can um, uh, read all of this. Um, I, I also uh, wanted to mention that um, uh, the, I just wanted to make sure I've got this here, that the, in, in, in the uh, clinical medicine and the COMET initiative, um, which are, are a, a sort of uh, one of the reasons that we sort of got into this work, uh, for those people who don't know, the, the COMET initiative is an initiative to develop a core set of um, outcomes that should be measured on a specific disease across studies. So for example, if you're doing some research on uh, rheumatology, that different uh, trials, for example, would use the same core outcomes, which could be uh, added to, supplemented to uh, by individual trials. And the importance of that is obviously uh, meta research downstream. And this is the sort of same rationale as, as we're looking at these core open science practices that, um, um, uh, uh, respondents um, from our Delphi process uh, would, would like to see. Now, um, there's a subgroup uh, that are uh, developing this dashboard and that's led by uh, Stephanie Housdean and Cameron Nalon. And I've just, <coughs> excuse me, I've just given you it, just a few snapshots of uh, this development and what we're what we're working on, in in terms of making this a an automated uh, dashboard, and we hope to be able to release a, a beta version 
uh, later on this year of, of the dashboard. Uh, also, um, I think what's quite positive is that uh, we will be piloting and we have um, uh, um, several uh, academic institutions that have been identified and are in the process of being onboarded uh, to uh, pilot the um, a, a beta version. And um, we're also obviously developing a, a comprehensive knowledge of actually how to do this because um, it, it may seem sort of simple. Okay, we, we've got a, an academic institution who's willing to pilot this, but the question is actually who in the institution would we approach? And so there's a whole bunch of very practical issues that we're hoping to develop into a, a, um, a very a useful sort of toolkit and, and, and documents that once we've got this for the piloting, we can share it more broadly for uh, 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 academic institutions who, who might be interested in this. It, obviously beyond academic institutions, this might be very useful for um, uh, funders and it could be obviously used in, in a sense with other stakeholders uh, such as uh, publishers. Um, I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank all the folks who've been in, uh, in, involved in our, our team. And I'm uh, gonna stop sharing now and uh, hand it over to Delwyn who's uh, been involved in our development as well as, as a number of others from Charité and other institutions. So thank you. Okay, so um, I'm very happy to be here today and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the discussion later and the panel discussion particularly. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about some work that we've done in the German context to support university medical centers to increase clinical trial transparency. And we've done that by doing a status quo analysis, and then we developed a dashboard to communicate those assessments to uh, university medical centers. Before going into the project, I just wanted to give you a bit more background on who we are. Um, so I work at the Charité, which if you're not familiar with, is the uh, largest university medical center and research hospital in Germany. And within the Charité, I work at the Berlin Institute of Health at the Quest Center for Responsible Research. Now, this is a pretty broad institute uh, that works across preclinical and clinical research and aims to increase value and reduce waste. And so we do um, a range of different projects that span research, education and policy, both at the institutional level and beyond. Uh, so I recognize that different fields are represented here today. So um, since this is quite a specific field, namely clinical trial transparency, I just wanted to spend a very brief moment um, explaining why we're, talk we're, we're working on this. So the project I'm talking about today really fits into a broader body of work um, that we're doing in Germany to, to support clinical trial transparency. Um, and the context here is that you know, clinical for clinical trials to generate useful and generalizable knowledge gain, they should be registered and reported in line with established uh, guidelines and in some cases laws. And um, that includes, for example, making the results openly accessible and findable to, you know, to, um, to patients and, and evidence synthesizers alike to make it easier for them to find and, and evaluate trials. And a lack of transparency or missing clinical trial evidence means that, for example, medical guidelines are based on a, on or are developed based on a, on a biased sample of trial findings. It also means that doctors are making decisions based on only part of the picture. And it also means that trial participants that may have, for example, volunteered to take an, an experimental drug are taking undue risk. So these are some of the reasons why we think this is important and we're working on this. Now, um, we have a multi-phase approach in this work. So the first phase of it, this approach was to evaluate um, status quo of transparency of registration and reporting uh, across German university medical centers. So this has been ongoing work over the last few years. And importantly, it's resulted in a data set that includes a cohort of clinical trials and the evaluation of those trials across uh, different uh, clinical trial transparency practices. Then in the second step, we wanted to pilot several communication and change strategies. And the idea here was to try and really 
try and change the state of quo essentially. So we started with um, engaging stakeholders and getting their views and then quite quickly moved into developing several prototypes um, and because we really felt that having something concrete uh, that we could then play through and then use and, and use in, in the debate going forwards would be very helpful, uh, particularly in, in further consultations with the community. So here we first developed an institutional dashboard to communicate transparency assessments to university medical center leadership. And secondly, at the trialist level, we also developed study specific report cards that give tailored uh, feedback on the transparency of a trial. And the third um, phase of this approach is to support implementation and systemic change. So essentially just take some of the work that we have done as a research institute and embed that more sustainably within an institution and more broadly. And here we've really tried to keep scalability in mind. So using automated approaches that could be used in other contexts as well. So now I'm just gonna move uh, to the, show you the institutional dashboard for trial transparency. Um, and just before showing it to you, I just wanted to um, briefly talk about um, the uh, one of the first things we did, which, which was to, in, to get stakeholder views. Um, so we actually asked UMC leadership um, funders, experts in research assessment and support staff uh, for their views on a prototype dashboard with metrics for responsible research. So this was slightly broader scope than what we ended up doing. And but this was a really, really helpful exercise and, and it really guided our work throughout. And I just wanted to point to one element that I think resonates really well with what David was just saying, um, which is just circled here. Um, and that was that stakeholders really emphasized the importance of having an overall framework that justified the, the, the practices that were included. And so I just included a link if you'd like to, to find or read more about, about this study. And having that in mind, we then decided to create a dashboard that focused on um, cl clinical trial, like established clinical trial registration and reporting practices that are in ethical, mentioned in ethical guidelines and, um, and in some cases are also required by law. So you can see the practices here. So we have prospective registration, so whether the trial was registered before enrollment of the first patient. There's also timely results reporting. Then also publication and registration linkage, so essentially making that evidence that is in different locations more findable. And finally, open access publication. And in each case, you can see in pink the, the normative basis, which is not exhaustive, but it's just some, some uh, of the key ones that are listed there for each practice. And so we basically built off that data set that we had in our first phase and then developed methods to assess the transparency practices within that data set. So some of these methods are automated, um, and but in some cases, unfortunately, we still uh, are relying on pretty time consuming manual checks, such as finding results publications from clinical trials. And with that, we actually developed the dashboard. So it's finalized and it's going to be made available uh, available alongside the accompanying publication early next week. So stay tuned. But this is a uh, screenshot that shows you a sneak peek of the of the first page. So you can see um, this. These are the results across all German university medical centers for this cohort of trials. Um, and for the transparency practices that I just mentioned. So you can see that um, we try to display the, the results and, and show progress over time. So that, that could also be taken into account. And then we also try to make it interactive and, and then display the results across different registries and, and to really allow people to explore the data in different ways. So that's um, that's just some uh, what, what it looks like briefly. And um, I just wanted to pause one second on different visualizations that we thought of in this registry. So on different pages, you can uh, you can explore the, the data in slightly different ways. So on the first page, as I just showed you, you have this data across um, all university medical centers. And then in the second visualization, you can see on the right here, there we allow each university medical center um, to just look, to focus on their own, so the results for, for their own institution and contextualize that to 
the, um, the results across all university medical centers. And then finally, we also have a side by side view. And here, the, the, um, the, the goal is really just to, to facilitate um, exchange and, and, and knowledge transfer. So some of the strengths and challenges. So I think one of the strengths of our approach was that um, we, we tried to really think of features to explore the data in different ways. And the design and content was very much shaped by stakeholder feedback. For example, we then included an infographic that gives the um, a clear rationale for, for the practices that were included. And finally, all the methods are fully openly available. So they can also be adapted for other, other usages. And in fact, that's already happening in different institutions um, in different countries. Some of the challenges, so first of all, we rely on registry data being accurate and up to date. This is something um, that is, is not really avoidable. Um, and then secondly, handling and clearly communicating limitations. So in other words, words how, do you, how do you prevent that limitations just to end up being the fine print that no one reads, but really become integrated in the discussion? Because I think that's really where a lot of the complexity lies. And, and I think it should be really a, a central part of the discussion. And then finally, some field specific challenges, for example, as I said earlier, finding results publications from clinical trials, which is still something that has to be done manually. So next steps. So we are planning to engage with the users of this dashboard. So we're planning a workshop with the Association of German Medical Faculties. So I'm very excited about this. We're going to talk about some of the next steps and how to support institutions in using this dashboard. We're also planning to update the cohort with more recent data because a lot of this is a retrospective assessment and we're also trying to think about ways um, together also with stakeholders and how to facilitate the interpretation of the data and the dashboard and finally we're hoping to scale up um, our approach uh, beyond uh, German university medical centers and also support ongoing initiatives that would be interested in in adopting some of these methods. And I just wanted to touch on on another point briefly, which is in the description of this webinar, there was also, you know, how can we support good practice? Um, and, and, and so I wanted to mention an initiative that we've been working on that is an attempt to go beyond monitoring and really try to support uh, the uh, support improvement directly. And so in this context, uh, we actually tailored some trial transparency report cards that give specific feedback and recommendations on how to improve um, at the level of an individual trial. And we did this in collaboration with the clinical trial office at the Charité. It's a pilot project. Um, and so we distributed these report cards to trialists and um, in some cases, some practices could still be improved on. Um, uh, following the, the completion of the trial. And so we, we evaluated whether this was helpful. And I'm not going to go in much detail, but I just wanted to show you a short glimpse of what a report card looks like. And you can see this is an example dummy report card, which lists a number of transparency practices. It gives a few details on the trial and also ways in which the transparency of that trial can still be improved. And for example, here, if you just focus on the second row, um, this report card says, well, in this case, this trial did not report summary results in the registry within one year of completion. And on the right, it gives uh, specific steps on how to do that, um, that are tailored to this specific trial. And so this was really an effort that we uh, that we've put together to try and support improvement. And um, these, are, um, these report cards are entirely scalable because they are automatically generated. So um, still in progress, but we're really excited about this. And then this is my last slide. I just wanted to mention an exciting new project that's coming up. So we, we would like to support funders to monitor and increase clinical trial transparency. And this is a project due to start in the summer where we specifically want to try and support funders uh, to, to monitor the, the transparency of the trials that they fund. Um, so we're gonna do a status quo analysis followed by, um, we're gonna do some interviews with funders to, to, to get a clear idea of what their current procedures are and how we can support them and what they would need. And then we're planning a series of co-creation workshops together with funders and other stakeholders in this space uh, to really co-create solutions together. And in that sense, it's been very helpful to have these 
uh, initial pilots, which we can use to say what, you know, just to show what's possible, but also how um, we can take on board further feedback. So we're going to try and adapt uh, or develop new tools and then finally implement them together with a funder. So if you're interested in participating in that, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so that's it from my side. I just really want to thank you for your attention. And I added some more information in the slides. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dylan. Will, will your slides be available? Uh, yes, I'll be sharing them. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, so that's a, a very brief canter through uh, health sciences and indicators dashboards that are being developed in the health sciences. Uh, please, uh, as we go through, please remember to be storing up your questions for the panel session, which will uh, happen later on um, after the uh, sometime after the break. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to sort of shift gears slightly and we're going to go to Finland. Um, and we've got an opportunity to hear from uh, Marita and from Jan. I think Marita might be speaking first about what's going on in terms of monitoring open research, open science in Finland. And uh, then Jan will be speaking about a, a European initiative. So I think, Marita, I'm handing over to you. Is that right? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk about the Finnish national monitoring uh, in this audience. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, in Finland, we had the first round of uh, the national monitoring last year, 2022, and that was uh, a lighter version, uh, to be correct, uh, because we know that many of the indicators will be developed further as our data sources improve, but the overall idea will remain the same, and it is that we monitor uh, the National Declaration for Open Science and Research and its supporting policies. So they form the basis uh, which we are uh, then following up in the monitoring. And we are looking currently at research performing organizations, but it's uh, in the pipeline to include the research funding organizations as well. And we divide the monitoring framework uh, into four areas where we also have the policies, and that is uh, the overarching culture for open scholarships, where we also include responsible researcher uh, assessment. Then we have open access to uh, publications and publishing. We have data and infrastructures uh, and open education. And we look into four different ways of promoting open science and research, and that is policy documents, uh, services, and outputs. Collaboration is in the pipeline for our next round of monitoring in 2024. Uh, and uh, we didn't have outputs uh, for uh, data or for culture for open scholarship in 2022. So that's also forthcoming. And we have uh, questions in survey and we have quantitative indicators uh, that then form the uh, scores uh, for these four areas. And by, for, from this course, then the overall assessment uh, of openness is uh, defined. Can I have the next slide? And our principles are that uh, the aim of the national monitoring is to support organizations. And we have uh, universities, universities of applied sciences and research institutes uh, in the study last year, which are three uh, different type of organizations. And it was that uh, most indicators were common to all respondents, but then there were some that did not apply to all. For example, because research institutes don't have education, uh, they did not answer uh, that part of, of the survey, or we didn't use the quantitative indicators in that area for those respondents. And in as much as possible, we use uh, the National Research Hub that aggregates data on publications and their openness, uh, research data, uh, infrastructures, software, um, and, and their openness. 
from from the research performing and research funding organizations as well. And, and then we have a survey for that uh, those parts of um, the study that we can't get from research.fi. And uh, the national monitoring is aligned with the EOSC monitoring. We want to avoid the situation that um, our organizations would have to reply to multiple publicated studies uh, from different uh, sources. And uh, so the indicators are developing and also our declaration and policies are developing. Currently, we have a period that's from 2020 to 2025. And uh, this year, next year, we are starting developing new uh, policies, new declaration. And then, of course, we will modify the monitoring model. And uh, can I have the next slide? So this shows um, the structure for the declaration and the supporting policies. And then in many areas, there are also recommendations giving more detailed input. And uh, we use also sometimes, uh, or it depends on the area, uh, how uh, far down the recommendations. For example, in licensing area, we have very good national recommendations and we do have questions in the survey of how they are being implemented in the organizations. But this is basically uh, what we are looking into in the monitoring. Uh, so uh, it's defined by this structure. And can I have the next slide? And here are then uh, concrete examples of indicators that we used last year. And in the guiding documents, uh, we asked if the organization has, or because it was the first round, it was also possible that um, they had a guiding document or a policy in de development, and it should be completed uh, in the next 12 months after the survey was closed. And we will actually be following up that uh, these documents have been created if they were not available when the survey was done. And as you can see, um, for example, open access to publishing, which is a very well established and area, uh, all respondents. We had a response rate of 100 percent from the universities and the universities of applied sciences. And we had 10 out of 12 research institutes replying. And all of the, the re respondents had uh, guiding documents on publishing. And then uh, we can see that, for example, uh, responsible researcher evaluation is a developing area where slightly above one half of the organizations already had a policy document or it was under development. Also, openness of infrastructures is clearly an area that's still developing in Finland. Uh, can I have the next slide? And then we also uh, asked about services that enable and uh, support open science and research. And there we were, of course, very happy to see that uh, all organizations have uh, services uh, fairly and equitably available to all personnel. And also you can see that um, the most common services uh, are in the publishing area because that's the most mature area. But also uh, two of them were in uh, culture for open scholarship and then uh, one of them, which is the general support was for openness of data. And then the least common services uh, are the ones that we expected that are in still in development. So there you can see, for example, narrative TVs were available in less than one fifth of the organizations and down to no organization uh, had automated the process of uh, sending metadata information uh, on open educational resources. Can I have the next slide? <laughs> and um, 
I mentioned that this is a developing format and uh, the previous speakers uh, had uh, mentioned uh, preprints several times. A preprints is also in the pipeline for the Finnish national monitoring, but uh, there we are dependent on the national data collection on publications. And we foresee that uh, on, in 2026 at the earliest, we will be able to use uh, preprints as an indicator and also um, research uh, plans. Uh, we already have uh, qualitative questions in the survey about them, but then uh, quantitative will also be slightly further ahead. Um, we have uh, for data sharing, we already have qualitative questions, but quantitative will be in the next round, 2024. Uh, our um, policy component for method and software will be released this year. That is why we did not have indicators uh, in that those areas last year. Uh, and because we have to give a reasonable preparation time for organizations, probably we will have uh, questions in that area uh, 2026 at the earliest. Open peer review also in the pipeline. And then, of course, uh, open access publishing, because that is uh, a well-established area. We had both qualitative and quantitative indicators in that area already last year. So this was my last slide, so I hand over to Yande. No, sorry, I had one more, and it is uh, about uh, the monitoring. Uh, uh, how uh, we do the next round. We are currently discussing with our open science expert plan panels uh, what indicators we will use in 2024. And it is especially the indicators for collaboration and the quantitative indicators for research data that uh, are the, the areas where we need most development. And then our uh, steering group will confirm the indicators uh, this May, and then the monitoring uh, will be carried out in May 2024, and the results will be released in October 2024. But uh, uh, after 2024, uh, then uh, the organizations will have 18 months, one and a half years uh, preparation time. So this was an exceptional uh, around this uh, 2024 still. So, uh, Janne, if I now hand over to you. There was still one. <laughs> uh, do you have it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, but uh, I already mentioned most of these topics and it is that uh, 2022 was a pilot and we are, uh, decreasing the importance of the survey, increasing uh, uh, quantitative indicators as the data gets more uh, mature. And uh, what we learned uh, in our survey 2022 is that uh, we really have to have uh, community support. We have, uh, the model was um, done in, uh, co-development we had it was open for uh, comments and now the new indicators we are developing for 2024 they are open for we are using workshops and the outcomes of the workshops can be commented so it's very much a co-development process and we have also learned that uh, if you do surveys uh, the wording is very important and even though they have gone now through several uh, review rounds uh, we still get feedback that the wording needs to be improved and uh, the more concise uh, wording and also it's good to have some kind of a longer supporting text sometimes of what what this meant with the questions and then, of course, um, the model, uh, the more uh, time there is to prepare and discuss, the better it will 
become. So time well spent there. Okay, thank you, Marita. So um, I will now uh, continue with the GRASP OS project. So my name is Janne Pölönen. I work at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. And um, the GRASP OS is a new EU funded project uh, kicked off on January in Athens. And GRASP OS uh, stands for Next Generation Research Assessment to Promote Open uh, Science. And the aim of the project is to investigate responsible research assessment approaches and interventions that take into consideration open science practices and also to build a federated infrastructure that will act as an open data space offering data indicators, tools, services and guidance to Okay, so sorry for the interruption. I don't know what happened there. So the uh, project will, uh, uh, it started in, in January. It uh, lasts uh, 36 months until December 25. We are in very early stages and we are looking indeed to develop uh, a system for rewards and recognition, um, uh, supporting open science and as a system that is uh, aware of open science practices using next generation of qualitative and quantitative metrics and indicators. And we are looking to develop these uh, assessment practices at three levels, including individuals and uh, groups, uh, research funding and performing organizations, as well as country level. And of course, what Marita just uh, showed you was one example of open science monitoring exercise taking place at institutional level in the country. Here is a, uh, quick show of the consortium. We have uh, 18 partners led by Athena uh, coming from 10 different countries. Uh, here is our general uh, project work plan. So I will quickly explain. Um, WP2 is uh, developing open science assessment framework. And then we have two work packages, WP3 and WP4, for developing federated open metrics infrastructure as well as tool, tools and services. And then we, then we have uh, two work packages, five and six, to engage with the community and pilots. So first I will um, say something about the Open Science Assessment Framework, OSAF. So, Per, this, is, this will be a toolkit to assist uh, tailoring and applying in practice the new generation open science aware responsible research assessment approaches. So we have a very practical aim in this, in this project. How to do and with what kind of information how, and how to use it responsibly. So some of the things that we are developing uh, is to provide options on how indicators and tools can be used in particular evaluation settings. So we are not looking to develop leak tables and, and one size fits all uh, metrics and, and practices, but really move toward contextualized situated assessment and how to uh, help uh, open science aware assessment take place in specific contexts. Uh, we will also be developing openness profile. This, there was earlier a project by Knowledge Exchange that developed a model for this, and this will be further developed in the project for, for research groups, research institutions. And there will also be an open science assessment registry for registering uh, openness profiles from different uh, contexts. Big part of the project is also related to the infrastructure. So one big obstacle for recognizing and rewarding open science practices that we don't have data, we don't have documentation, information to support assessment. And this is especially important in the higher aggregate level when we are looking at institutions and countries. So um, the project will be developing an ELSC integrated uh, infrastructure that offers data, tools, and services to support more responsible assessment practices. Uh, 
and there are some aspects that we are going to take into account. So these really have to be fit for purpose tools and services. So there is a very close engagement of specific pilots to which indicators and services will be tailored. And of course, we also pay a lot of attention in the project for the uh, quality of the data and information produced. What is the coverage, quality, openness, and uh, aspects like this. And also, automated and manually corrected annotated metrics will be produced in the process. I also mentioned that community is an important part of the project. So we are really working closely with broad range of stakeholders, as well as a specifically selected group of pilots to co-design, showcase, validate, and evaluate the open science aware indicators, tools, and services and practices. Here is a slide showing the selection of pilots that we have. So first of all, there are a group of pilots uh, representing funding agencies and national stakeholders uh, who are operating infrastructure for assessment. We have also a group of pilots uh, representing universities and research institutions and more thematic disciplinary based uh, groups uh, representing computer science, agricultural and veterinary sciences, as well as social sciences and humanities. And we are of course liaising with uh, a broad range of communities of practice, of experts in open science, responsible assessment metrics and infrastructure. And certainly a very important uh, uh, stakeholder and, and collaboration group is Quara, Konosk, Super Mori, and, and so forth. And here is a list of um, different outcomes to be expected. As I mentioned, we are in very early stage, so uh, it is not yet possible to present you very specific details of, of what we have done, but there is uh, a lot to expect from this exciting project. And I hope that we are able to share with this community our results and also uh, take into consideration what, what is developed here by different uh, groups in the area of open science aware assessment and indicators. Thank you, that is all for me. And sorry for the short uh, dis disruption. That's okay, thank you very much, Jana. And um, I'm sure Will will be able to edit out the, uh, the interruption uh, in the recording. Um, so, uh, I suggest we take a, a break now. We've we've heard really quite a lot of information from a wide range of uh, different sort of uh, projects and initiatives. Um, so let's take a break. Think about what questions you might have for the panel. Uh, there will be a panel session later on. After the session, we'll hear from from Rachel Bruce uh, at UKRI and from Emma Henderson from the University of Surrey to get these sort of funder and institutional perspectives. And then we'll have a panel session. But uh, let's go and get a cup of tea and let's come back at uh, 22 minutes past the hour. So in 10 minutes from now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, and I hope you had a, a good stretch of your legs and managed to uh, walk around a bit. Uh, these are uh, long and intense sessions, so it's important for us to have a break where we can. We heard a lot of information before the break from, from initiatives around uh, the health and life sciences from, from a publisher uh, and some really fascinating work going on both in, in Finland and across, across Europe through the GRASP OS project from Jana. So we've got an opportunity now to, to hear from a couple of um, uh, UK stakeholders. So uh, the major funder in the United Kingdom is, is UK Research and Innovation. So first we'll hear from Rachel Bruce, uh, and then we'll hear from an institution, uh, University of Surrey, that's been doing some really good thinking around what, what indicators and key performance indicators might be useful from their perspective. And we'll hear from Emma Henderson about that. But first, can I turn to Rachel for some remarks from, from a funder's perspective? Uh, thanks very much, Neil. Um, and um, yeah, it's been fascinating uh, to be here um, this afternoon and hear all of the different perspectives. So um, I've been asked to say something from a funder perspective on the purpose, limits and opportunities that there might be with um, open research or open science indicators. 
Um, and I'm not quite sure I can precisely um, answer that sort of challenge given um, the whole breadth, but I have got some reflections that I want to um, share with you. So I can of course say that UK research and innovation are extremely interested in this issue. Um, and hopefully that's clear from the vast array of work and even going right back to um, the metric tide, which is now some time ago, but you know, all of the careful considerations there around the use of responsible metrics. And now we've obviously moved on really to a discourse around responsible indicators. Um, and also currently the work around um, responsible research assessment. But I think as, as Neil said, the focus of the UKRN work isn't so much on responsible research assessment, but looking um, more at a sort of organizational um, and sector level, as I understand it. Um, as a funder, what we really want to do is play our role um, in improving the research environment. Um, and to do that, of course, indicators are helpful um, and they contribute to many aspects of our work and role. Um, for open research, we often hear from um, stakeholders and perhaps the, the, their assumption is that we are really interested in them from a policy compliance point of view. Um, and of course, that is one aspect, um, but really, um, we are more interested in progress of the research and innovation system. Um, and are we collectively um, achieving the values that we collectively want from that research and innovation system? Um, but as part of that, are our policies and interventions um, contributing positively um, to that research and innovation um, environment? Um, or are there unintended consequences and perhaps negative consequences? Um, but of course, it is a, a, a collective um, in, endeavor. So, so working um, together with other stakeholders is extremely important. At the moment, um, we are, for example, looking at the development of our monitoring and evaluation framework for our open access policy. And we do want to know um, about the articles that are published and when and how. Um, but we also want to understand other questions. So, for example, can researchers, research organisations in the sector afford that publication model? Um, are we pursuing um, a sustainable um, system around research and a system by which um, all researchers can equally participate? So there are these, these broader questions that we also want to be able to understand um, in that framework. Um, and then, of course, the one around impacts. So um, is research being accessed, used, and is it contributing to further research and innovation and the economy and society? And all of those are um, really, really challenging. So, um, so coming back down to um, some of those challenges. So um, it is, of course, really difficult to simply assess a baseline um, and so, for example, at the moment, um, my team is looking at and trying to understand far more about the practice around open academic books um, as one of the key um, products from uh, the research that we fund. And because we've got an introduction of a, a new um, open access policy in that area. And it's extremely hard to do and challenging. And I just think it's quite a good example of why. Um, in order to interpret some indicators and data, you really need to have a lot of context and human intervention. And we're particularly finding it here because, of course, there isn't that much um, transparency around the data and information that's available. And there isn't much um, standardization. Um, and so there are a lot of gaps and a lot of interpretation required and you're looking rather at estimates um, than any precision. So I just think um, that in itself, although it's quite a niche area, um, is something we need to know more about, um, and it's extremely challenging, and it just kind of highlights the way in which you need to um, really bring that human intervention and context to understanding the indicators that we might have when we're talking about quantitative indicators. Um, the other um, aspect that um, I think, you know, 
we we're also finding a challenge at the moment is looking at um, data and is the data that um, that is a product of the research that we fund is it is it fair um, and of course we want to do that in order to inform um, an update of our policies and interventions and investments. Um, and again, a hugely challenging area. So it's really interesting to see some of the developments that have been um, talked about today. So overall, we want to understand open science practices as outlined by many of the speakers. Um, and this can also just, just to highlight, include things around organizational um, support. So um, training and policies and those sorts of um, interventions that can help progress um, open science. Um, and a lot of this is so that we can monitor progress and inform our decision making. Um, but also, I think um, increasingly, it's becoming um, important to collectively help us um, understand about research developments and the changes that we're making to the research system in a way in which we can um, respond and adjust. So what some might call research and research or meta research. Um, and that is incredibly important and something that we um, work with many stakeholders on. Um, and I think the discussion today um, is, is very valuable um, in moving forward that agenda. Um, I just wanted to um, share a few findings from some work that Research Consulting um, did for us. Um, so there was a, a study that was commissioned by UK Research and Innovation, Cancer Research UK and Guild HE that was looking at um, research integrity indicators. Um, and just as a backdrop, so often when uh, looking at the priorities for open science indicators with other partners, often um, it's concluded that we don't need indicators for open science. We, we should actually be looking at indicators um, that reflect the values of the research system. But of course, um, open science indicators actually underpin some of those values. And in particular, um, they are part and parcel of uh, research integrity. Um, and, and one of the sets of indicators that can show progress um, and practice around research integrity. So just to share a few of the high level findings um, from that work. Um, so, Overall, it started with a view of what might be research integrity indicators for stakeholders. And it's very much from the perspective of the system level and the um, things like the research integrity concordat that research organisations and research funders in the UK um, aspire um, to implement and practice. Um, and the, the team quickly concluded that, um, as many speakers have said here today, that we, when looking at indicators, need to take a wide view uh, and, and not just look at quantitative, but also qualitative um, indicators. Um, essentially, the purpose is to be able to assess current performance um, or changes um, so that different actors in the system can understand, plan and improve. Um, and in the work that was undertaken, um, the, it, they were obviously uh, seeking to identify research integrity indicators and of course the low hanging fruit were in fact um, ones that would relate to the openness and transparency aspect of research integrity and the um, articles, preprints, data sets and the sorts of, um, I suppose, let's say counting of outputs. But of course, they were very wary of the fact that um, not all that can be counted counts. Um, and as has come up in discussions um, today, that we need to think about how to show the invisible um, and the wider sets of indicators um, for research integrity um, and openness and tra transparency aspects are required. Um, and they concluded that in terms of moving forward in this agenda, there were some key aspects that we need to think about. So I'll just run through those um, finally. So one is that um, in order to really understand the um, purposes and goals of um, indicators, there needed to be a much broader discussion 
to refine those purposes. And as part of that broad discussion, um, we need to think about these aspects of quantitative and qualitative, but also engage all actors, so publishers, funders, researchers, research organisations, and to have um, a more um, inclusive discussion um, around uh, indicators. Um, also, the aspect of um, integrity um, and avoiding ranking, so something that I know we all talk about, but um, they were just emphasising that indicators, we really needed to ensure that they promote um, good practices and do not promote rankings. Um, and then also remain aware of challenges, so um, issues around the potential of gaming or misunderstandings and miscalculations, and also the sorts of misalignment that can happen across the system. So, for example, some form of indicator for um, a research organisation performance may also have implications on the way in which um, researchers um, are then perhaps uh, judged or assessed, and so to be very aware of those issues. Um, to take into account diversity um, and EDI issues and to be aware that context varies. Um, and then finally, to pursue um, the agenda of development of indicators in a co-creative way, um, recognising that arbitrarily setting something is not going to really be, be very beneficial um, and that co-creation is absolutely essential um, to progress. So I just wanted to reflect on um, those key issues. I think um, from a funder's perspective, we are interested in um, open science um, indicators, but also in that broader context of um, the research and innovation system. Um, so that's all from me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Really appreciate that. And it just illustrates the, you know, the wide range of ways in which uh, funders play positive roles in this space and, and um, ways in which uh, research indicators of different kinds are relevant to the, to the work that uh, funders uh, do. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, don't forget, everyone, to be thinking about what your questions are for the panel, which we'll turn to uh, after our last uh, and certainly not least speaker, uh, Emma from the University of Surrey, would you like to tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing there? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a project that I've been leading along with colleagues at the University of Surrey in the UK. Um, so this work is on a smaller scale from what we've been hearing about for the rest of the afternoon because this is um, an institutional perspective. Um, but it will still echo many of many of the points that have been raised by the previous speakers. Um, but before I start, I want to emphasize that what I'm presenting today is very much work in progress. So it's where we're currently at um, and it hasn't gone through our executive board at Surrey. Um, but I'm going to present some considerations in developing what are our draft open research metrics. Um, I will talk about the objectives of our metrics, some principles behind their development, and then some challenges um, and some limitations to consider. So our metrics are mapped to our open research strategy. And at the outset, we had a set of objectives for our metrics. So overall, the purpose of the metrics is to provide insights that will drive our strategy to support open research. And within that, we want to understand and we want to monitor. So we want to understand both the availability and the uptake of open research advocacy, education, training, policies across all disciplines at the institution. And we'd also, to some extent, like to assess the impact of the initiatives that we have at Surrey. So this is focusing on resources. And we're also interested in the researcher experience. So barriers and enablers that they're experiencing and the attitudes of researchers to open research. And in terms of monitoring, um, we're interested in monitoring our progress against our open research objectives. And those objectives are generally related to output. So things like open data, open access, and also to monitor compliance with university and fund open research requirements. Um, 
because the metrics are about informing policy and strategy, um, this is not about individual researcher assessment. So the smallest unit of analysis would be at a faculty level. So in developing our metrics, we use the scope framework, which was developed by iNORMS. Um, and this is a five stage process for evaluating research responsibly. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to mention that one of the principles that underlie scope is to evaluate only when necessary. So at the beginning of the project, we considered whether to measure, should we, is it the right thing to do and should we do it now? And so a couple of considerations were that if our goal is to increase adoption of open research, we really need to know what progress we're making. So we need to know where we're currently at, where we want to be and how far along the road we are. But the counter to that is, and especially at an institutional level, every minute, every resource, every pound spent measuring is not spent promoting and advocating open research. So I guess the question is, is the resource spent on evaluating netting the same amount of benefit? And I think this is where the UK project, UKRM project could come into its own because in pooling costs and expertise and resources, um, the benefits um, can outweigh the cost. So this is the scope framework that we started from. Um, and importantly, it says to start with what you value. So this is not about valuing, um, sorry, measuring what's easy, but um, what uh, you actually value, uh, what your objectives are, um, not how you're evaluated externally, but the objectives of the institution. Um, we also thought about who and why we were measuring and um, considered both quantitative and qualitative measures. We thought about any unintended consequences of measuring, so whether they be positive or negative, how the metrics might be gamed um, and who we might be discriminating against in developing the metrics. And then the final stage of scope is to evaluate. So look at your evaluation, what went well, what didn't go so well, and then adapt and iterate. And I think that's gonna be important with open research metrics, we're at an early stage with them and everything is moving relatively quickly. So based on the five scope principles, we developed a suite of metrics and they are split into three phases. And this is a balance between what's reasonably feasible to track on an ongoing basis and what's maximally informative um, about our progress towards an open research culture. So phase one, we've called the open research journey. And these are um, things like open research education and training. And these are precursors and enablers to open research outputs, which are, are what we're measuring in phase two. So phase two, um, we're concentrating initially on two main behaviors, which are open data related behaviors and open access. And these are most applicable across a range of disciplines, um, and they're also mandated by university and funder policies. And then we have a longer term aim for a phase three, which is about providing concrete examples for our researchers of the benefits of open research practices. So examples of reuse of data of impact, for example. Um, and we hope that having actual concrete examples of how open research has worked well will serve as an incentive to engage in open research. So within each of these values, we have a range of metrics. Um, and I don't have time to go into each of those today, but for example, under training, we'd measure um, the availability and uptake of training by topic, um, and ideally also feedback from the participants. Um, and initially, we wanted to establish baselines, and once established, we will review those and we'll set targets where appropriate. Um, at the moment, we have one KPI, so where we have a specific target, and that's open access. Um, and that's because that's a more developed metric than, than the others. 
So the phase one metrics, those that relate to things like training and education, have been proposed in the context of behaviour change theory, and specifically um, Susan Mickey's COMBI model. So this model suggests that behaviour is part of an interacting system that involves these three components, opportunity, motivation and capability. And to change behaviour, one or more of the components must change in order to reconfigure the system. And they must all be present and they must all be in sufficient levels for the behaviour to occur. So in this case, open research behaviours. And you can see that motivation interacts with both opportunity and capability. So motivation is very important in this model. And here I have mapped some relevant examples to the three components. So um, thinking about opportunity would be things like whether researchers have sufficient resources and time, um, but also cultural and social influences. So are they the only person working in open research in their team or are PIs and um, their peers also engaging in this behavior? Um, in terms of motivation, thinking about things like habits, is this kind of, is open research ingrained in your work process? Is it a priority? So is it um, a priority above other things that might take up your time? And beliefs could be things like um, my ability to carry out an open research behavior or how vulnerable it might make me feel. Or it could be a belief about identity, whether I identify as open research, open researcher. Um, and this is also where external incentives come into play. That's probably a whole other talk. Um, the capability is about the ability to carry out the behavior. So this is knowledge via education and skills via training. Um, and it's also something as simple as awareness of the behavior. So um, is, is the researcher aware that there's an issue or that there's a need to change behavior? So we want to use the COMBI model alongside the metrics in phase one to explain um, what we see in our phase two output metrics. So for example, if we see, um, if, sorry, if we didn't see an increase in data sharing activities, we could look back at phase one and see perhaps there's lots of training, but it hasn't been taken up. Um, and then we need to look at whether this is due to lack of time or incentive or awareness, for example. So we also considered the five key principles of responsible use of metrics in developing our draft metrics. Um, and some particularly important aspects, I think, are robustness. So um, developing informative baselines um, and being very clear about the limitations of the data. Transparency, we want to be very open about both our plans and also the data that we use. Um, and reflexivity. So we have developed the metrics in consultation with stakeholders and we continue to do so. Um, and also an awareness that open research and open research metrics are a very fast moving area. So we'll need to keep reviewing and keep adapting the metrics. So some challenges, um, the metrics will only be as good as the data that is available. Um, and none of these things is particularly easy to measure. So we have done some very initial piloting, looking at, for example, open data, um, and we've come across issues with false positives, missing DOIs, the challenge that you know data is in multiple repositories. Um, so not, not easy. Um, also in terms of resource, what we have um, planned so far is very manual, and that means it's very time consuming. Um, and obviously an automated approach, like the data CIA, um work that Ian presented would be much more scalable. Um, and relatedly, um, a question about resource, about how we make this a priority, <laughs> excuse me, for institutions. So how we get, um, uh, how we gain institutional support for this kind of work. And then final challenge is in the reporting. So we know that metrics can be used in the wrong way. Um, GIFs are not meant to measure individuals. 
um, but they are, and ref results are not supposed to be put in lead tables and compared, but but they are. So I think that this is something that we need to think about from the very beginning, from the development of metrics um, and put in fail safes um, as far as we can. So one thing that we've been thinking about is um, to interpret and contextualize um, our metrics and report them in a narrative form that integrates the limitations. And so it would be this kind of narrative report that stakeholders would use to inform decisions rather than just um, standalone figures. Um, and finally, some limitations. So one of our aims was that we would like to be able to measure the impact of what we're doing as a university. Um, but there are so many external factors at play that we can't assume a causal relationship between what we're doing at the University of Surrey um, and what we see in our metrics. Um, and this is problematic in practice because by acting upon these metrics, for example, if we updated a training program based on feedback, we, we are assuming causality. Um, we've also been careful to couple qualitative measures with quantitative measures, but we still have quite a lot of quantitative measures in our initial plans. Um, so ideally, we'd like to include surveys and interviews um, to better understand our researchers' attitudes and experiences, along with metrics for outputs and how those things correlate. Um, and finally, measuring what matters. So quantitative indicators are only informative about the presence or absence of an open research um, behavior. So for example, in our um, open data metrics, we have things like whether a metadata record has been created in our repository and whether there's a data availability statement. Um, but the presence of a metadata <coughs> record stating that data have been shared is not informative about whether the data are fair, and whether they're going to be be able to be reused, um, and the presence, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, of a data availability statement saying that the data is available on request doesn't mean that the authors will share the data when asked. Unfortunately, we have research that showed that they don't. Um, and so I think this quote from um, Lizzie Gad is very applicable here: that what's at fault is not the existence of the metric, but what it is being used as a proxy for. So I think we need to avoid replicating the issues and thinking from traditional metrics and measure what matters. Um, and this goes back to the first stage of scope, which is measuring what you value. So as I mentioned, this is um, very much work in progress and we welcome any feedback. So I've put my contact details here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Emma. That's been a really helpful uh, sort of way to focus uh, really on on sort of practice at an institutional level, which I think is a really good lens to look at this through. Um, so we're moving now into the panel session. So I'm hoping that all of the speakers would now like to turn their videos back on. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone on the on the workshop, on the webinar, has been thinking of useful and interesting questions to ask our panelists. Um, so um, please raise your hand if you have a question. While you're thinking of questions, then I will take chair's prerogative uh, and ask this, which is, um, so we heard from, from David uh, earlier on in the workshop about the consensus that has sort of been possible in the health sciences around some of the core measures of openness and transparency. And I suppose I wondered, you know, what are the conditions around health research in particular that make that kind of consensus possible? And do those kinds of conditions hold in other kinds of disciplines, do we think? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Neil. Um, I think what might make um, consensus a little bit easier in health sciences um, is uh, existing and forthcoming mandates uh, from governments 
and funders. So an example um, in Canada is that uh, data sharing is being rolled out at a federal level uh, as a mandate. Um, in the United States, the, um, the White House's uh, Office for Open, I don't know, Open Science and um, Technology OS. Policy. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, they, they've made a very strong announcement that as of the end of uh, 2025, uh, data underlying all federally funded publications will, will have to be shared. There's also an abundance of evidence in, in the health sciences, for example, that, um, uh, for example, uh, trial registration is not particularly good. We just examined recently 7,000 uh, clinical trial registration from Canadian trialists and found that uh, about 50% of them were inappropriately registered. Uh, in, in our system, for example, in Canada, it's um, largely funded by taxpayer dollars. So I think that becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, whether that's applicable across disciplines, um, I think I'm probably not the best person to speak to that, uh, but I can see that, um, for example, uh, certain uh, practices or behaviors like registration may or may not be applicable, for example, in the humanities. Sure, thank, thanks, David. I, I suspect you're right about that, but whether or not the you know, the conditions, if there are similar sorts of practices that we might look at in terms of transparency in other disciplines and that consensus could be could be achieved in some of those, you know, that's an interesting question, I think. Would any of the other panellists like to, to come in on that? No, that wasn't a very good. Oh, um, OK. We've got James, did you want to come in on that or are you going to ask a different question? Uh, yeah, different question. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'll come to Marie's question in the chat after after you've had a chance to ask yours. Oh, okay. Um, so apologies if this has already been uh, answered in the talks, uh, but I was I was interested in uh, how how you're actually um, gathering the data for your metrics. So if you're using a system like uh, Elsevier's Pure to like pull in the data, or what kind of systems are you using to actually gather your data and also, um, I guess, like assess the research outputs as well. So those of you who are actually doing dashboards or similar sorts of things, uh, do you want to uh, come on that, Del, and do you want to go first? Sure, I can quickly answer that. Uh, thanks, James, for your question. Um, so in our case, for the uh, clinical trial transparency dashboard, we're mainly relying on publicly available clinical trial registries. And so all the data is openly available. And I think just touching on what um, uh, David was also just saying, I think that's also a, a reason why it's it's relatively like more amenable in that in that space because you know we have these registries and there's definitely been issues in terms of how they're being used, but um, that's changing quite rapidly. And um, and also it's getting easier to get information from different registries. So yeah, that's how we what we've been doing for the most part. And then when it comes to publication based metrics, so you know a clinical trial will be completed, and then we'll look whether they publish the results in a journal publication. That's been a, a more intensive effort where we essentially we first check the registries to see whether they link to publication. But if they didn't do that, then we actually did, uh, you know, searches and across different bibliometric databases. So just in Google Scholar, searching manually for a results publication for that trial. So that was a more intensive pro uh, process, but um, can still be done. Thanks, Darwin. I thought it was really interesting actually looking at David's results on some of that. Sorry, this is a slight tangent, but... Um... The, the reporting of clinical trials and systematic reviews was very less important as the registration of those trials, which I thought was really sort of an interesting, if I've interpreted that right, was an interesting thing. Um, but I don't know, Marita or, or Ian, do you want to talk about data sources or Jana? 
Yeah, and do you want to go? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I can say something about uh, data collection in Finland. We have a, a national data source, data hub that integrates information from local grid systems of universities. And these are all, they can be in-house uh, grid systems or they can be pure or any of the commercial systems. And uh, uh, the open access information, first of all, we collect a, a complete peer-reviewed output of universities. So we have all kinds of publication types, all languages, including books, conferences, whatever type of publication output. And this relies uh, partly on imports from international information sources like um, Web of Science or Scopus, but then of course the more dif difficult publication types are self-reported by researchers. And also it is indicated in the local CRIS systems whether the publication is open access and in what way. And that is partly validated by uh, data collection personnel, uh, typically in the university libraries. So that way there is a, a very comprehensive information on an open access status of publications, all kinds of outputs, and also whether they are uh, self-archived. Uh, but then when we move to other, other kind of uh, outputs, like uh, preprints or data, uh, uh, pre-registrations, so forth, but then we are in much thinner ice and there is a lot to do to develop the data collection because it is now very much built for reporting uh, publication output, the more traditional type of output. Yeah, th thanks, Jana. Uh, so, Marita, do you want to follow up on that uh, around the situation in Finland? Yes, I would just like to add that uh, for data, uh, not all data gets um, deposited to the national repository, but it's also spread out in various international repositories that are used in different fields of science. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marita. Ian, uh, PLOS from PLOS perspective. Yeah, just very quickly, because I can see there's a number of other questions coming through as well. And so in our case, and when I say our case, I mean, data seer, um are leading a lot of this work on our behalf. Um, it, it's uh, full text of articles is really important. So we, uh, content is accessed from the PLOS API, full text API, and the PubMed Central API. So open access content, so the full text can be analyzed. Um, and for some of the things that, that are being measured, like preprint detection, then the Crossref API and the data site APIs are also important because those are where the DOIs for certain preprint servers are, are stored. But if you're interested in more information, I can pop the methods document in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That identifier infrastructure is quite important to this, isn't it? So um, let's let's get that working as well as we can. David, did you want to come in on this? Uh, thanks, Neil. I, I just wanted to make a general point when we're thinking about uh, quantitative uh, data collection and metrics is, is that, um, you know, in, in medicine, we talk about the positive predictive value, meaning that if you have a positive test, you actually have the, the disease. And I think here we need to be very clear that um, actually the metrics that we're collecting, we shouldn't assume they're correct. What we need to do is be able to make sure that people who are collecting this data, that they, in a sense, report sensitivity and other sort of metrics about the authenticity of the data. I think that goes across all disciplines and we shouldn't forget it. And we should really try to encourage people who are collecting quantitative information to actually provide that so we know the sources in, in, in sort of real. Yeah, th thanks, David. I think, you know, the. Uh, the core principles, I think, of, of, of research of reliability, validity and, and ethics are absolutely central to the work that, that we're doing here. Uh, so let's turn, I think, to the question, Marie, you, you do you want to ask, ask the question yourself? Um, hi, everyone, it's a great event. Thanks very well, much. Um, could you put your microphone down? So. Yes, I have Thanks. <laughs> I hope I'm not too loud there. So thanks for the great event. It's so interesting. Um, I've been working in the area of research data management and sharing for nearly 10 years now. So when I started, come from a library background, um, it was all about, you know, 
informing researchers about how they had to comply with certain policies, etc. And um, over the time, I've never actually been aware of any um, cases where, you know, obviously it might not be something that's published, but where something's sent back or someone has been sanctioned or you go into trouble or whatever, you know, for that. And I just, that, that was really my question, you know, whether, I mean, it might be something that I realise that not everyone um, would, would would be open about that information, but I just wondered if, if, if it was something that the funders were actively, you know, checking on and, and sort of, um, so thank you. That's great. Rachel, I'm inevitably going to turn to you on yeah, this question. Okay. Um, I think, well, in um, a number of our council's policies, we do say that if data isn't treated in the way in which that particular discipline seeks, then um, you're at risk of having either your final payment, you know, withheld. I think that, that you know, that does happen in, in cases. I, I can't say, um, and I would have to talk to colleagues to see, um, whether how regularly that sort of thing might happen in with regards to um, an actual data requirement, because it's obviously something that can happen with regards to many of the terms and conditions um, on receiving the fund. But in general, um, I I know that this this issue has been um, something that's been uh, discussed between research organisations and funders, and I'm I'm not aware of many because I saw you said many um, cases um in in terms of in the sort of general principles and it does vary from um funder to funder but um in general our principles around um sanctions is anything we do has to be reasonable and proportionate um and um more often than not we're talking really about our agreement with the research organization and so the research organization um needing to ensure that those good practices are in place and that the researchers have the ability to be able to manage so i think you know there's also a good faith element so anyway that's um i, th I think um i would be interested in hearing from others if they are um, more up to date than me but those are the general sort of principles I think that we um, adhere to um, and I have heard of funders um, other funders as well withholding payments and things. Thanks Rachel uh, and of course funders are not the only entities that might uh, impose consequences for not data sharing publishers and journals may well do the, the, the same as well. Um, so unless anyone wants to leap in that, uh, I'm going to move on. Thanks for that, that reply, Rachel. Um, Jim, do you want to um, ask your question or do you want me to ask it for you? Um, sure, I can ask it. I don't know if, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, um, yeah so I, uh, I consider myself more of a quantitative research, but I work in a school of architecture, so I work a lot with people who, you, who use qualitative methods and from sort of humanities backgrounds. And um, a lot of the conversations I have with them around open research, um, that they have a lot of uncertainties around it. Um, and I can sort of hear their voices in my head when we start now talking about open research indicators, some concerns there, because for from, from that, those sort of disciplines, I think it may be slightly more difficult, for example, to publish their data openly, you know, that there are greater sort of um, difficulties in anonymity and that kind of thing. And also some of the, the key concepts we think about in terms of open research, so like reproducibility, perhaps some of those concepts don't don't really make sense or don't really apply in certain contexts within sort of more humanities based research. So I just wonder if, yeah, there's a danger that uh, or, or to try to how do we avoid discriminating against people from certain in certain disciplines? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. I think it's a really good point. And, and concepts, even concepts such as data, are questionable in, in some in some places. Um, and, you know, absolutely, those disciplinary differences are important and need to be respected in whatever we do. And anybody from this panel want to come in and comment on that? Um, it's a, a not an easy question. I can just say something about it. Um, I think, yeah, when when you measure, there are always going to be unintended consequences and some of them might be good, but some of them might be bad. And so as a direct answer, I think, yes, there, there is a danger. Um, 
but it depends what you're going to do obviously with these metrics what what the point of them is um so at Surrey we're not using them to assess individual researchers um and we are only using them at like a higher level of granularity um but I think this is potentially a reason to have like a, a buffet of measures where you could have ones that are applicable to a discipline or to a faculty and they don't have to tick every single thing that's not relevant to them. Um, and also to Ian's point earlier about not only measuring um, what's happened, but what could what could happen. So if there's no data to be shared, we need to know that as well as the, the data hasn't been shared. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Diana? Yes, I think uh, this, this was very, very good point that we have to take into consideration the disciplinary differences. I, I fully agree with Emma that uh, we need to uh, be very careful in what we do with the indicators. I think um, one essential thing is to uh, rely a lot on research on research that we really understand the disciplinary differences. So whatever indicators we use, whatever data we collect, we need to understand what are the uh, biases in terms of disciplines, even in terms of uh, different types of organizations like uh, basic research universities or applied uh, universities of applied sciences or so forth. They, there are many, many differences. And I think research on research should be informing our indicator development and, and use. Yeah, thanks, Diana. I think that's a really important point. We need to be evidence informed on this. Um, right. Um, are there other questions or shall I leap in with, with one of mine? I'm going to leap There's in. There's one in the chat, Neil. Oh, is there? Have I missed it? Uh, is Lauren. that? Ah, yes. Lauren, do you want to ask yours? Sorry, I missed it. Um, yeah, let me try and get, <laughs> sorry, I'm in the middle of a Teams Zoom mode at the moment. Thanks, Phil. Um, yes, it's for Martin Yana. Thank you. I, you. I thought your presentation was really interesting, actually, and I'd never thought about the indicators around um, the kind of support, an OA expert, and using that as an indicator. I wondered how you did that at scale. Uh, can you? Please repeat the question. I didn't quite catch it. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, in your presentation, some of the indicators that you were demonstrating, one of them was around um, the costs. So you were using costs and you were breaking them down into different criteria. And one of the criteria was around. So, for example, you were talking about transitional agreements, um, APC costs. And one was around um, the, the actual support and services. So you were actually measuring that as well. I think you were doing it in person hours. Um, so and I, I wondered how you did that at scale like that, because it's quite difficult institutionally to capture that. Yes, uh, that was very difficult indeed. Uh, that is a part of uh, the survey that's managed actually by our national library. And we acted only as data collectors for, for that part. Uh, but uh, it was the best estimate the Institute could provide. So, so we know that uh, it is not hard facts, if you wish, yeah. but uh, their best estimate. Okay. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks. So I'm trying to keep up with the um, the questions in the chat. There is quite there's quite a lot coming through to me, if not to anyone else. Um, so there's a question here from, uh, and I apologise, I forget your name, Mata Palfi. Um, yes. Thanks. It's a question to Ian about the open science indicator. So uh, um, yeah. I'm a big fan of this uh, framework, and I was just wondering if, for the three indicators you already measured, um, are you planning to expand that, for example, for preprinting and um, code sharing? Are you thinking of looking at licenses, the type of licenses that researchers use? And I realize this might be a really tricky one, but for data sharing, I'd be really interested to know if there are any approaches you can think of of um, looking at, you know, how rich the metadata is that researchers share in these repositories. Because of course, it's not enough to just um, 
you know, share our raw data in our repository. It also has to be usable for researchers. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, so yes, uh, we do have thoughts on that. And um, again, there's much more detail in the white paper I referred to, which, which sets out the framework. So um, the approach that we're taking right now, if anyone's familiar with the FAIR acronym, um, I guess we're assessing the F and the A, are things findable and accessible? And in, in the framework, we, we, we've aspired to in the future also to be able to measure interoperable and reusable. And things like the license are exactly the kind of extra information which help us to assess not just availability, but also aspects of reuse or quality or those kinds of things. Um, we also have a roadmap to measure more than the three things that are currently in the data set. Right now, we're working on one for with, with data here for protocol sharing, step-by-step -step instructions for research sharing. And the fifth one is to be determined based on, on further communication and consultation with others. I'll pop a link in the chat, but thank you for the question. Great, thanks very much, Ian. Um, Carol, uh, you've got a couple of questions. Do you want to, to oh, sorry, before we go there, Rachel. If, a, just a very small uh, comment on that. So in terms of the licensing, we, we would really love um, to have more information about licensing. Um, and um, it's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to work around improving um, some of the metadata and standards and machine readability. Um, and so, so just to say that, you know, one of the asset things we're doing along our trajectory here is really working with different stakeholders to define um, what, what best practices and standards we should be using and adopting and where either ourselves as a funder or research organizations or standards agencies um, can actually put some support in place to increase the adoption because it, it is clearly one of those issues. It's very difficult to measure that I and that R. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rachel. Carol. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, my part of my question has been answered, which was particularly to do with cost. I'm interested in the burden of cost. And there was um, a, a little bit of an answer uh, from Marita, but is there any effort here in the metrics collection or the indicators collection to get some sort of in indication of scale of the cost of open science? And I don't mean open access, because frankly, I don't care about open access. That's last year's. I know Rachel, that was gonna make her laugh. That's why I did it. Uh, but I really like it's, it's, it's like, let's move on guys i mean data i mean open access to data so um is, is there any kind of um work planned around that because it's a tremendous burden um and also um we have no biz business models at the moment for any of the repositories where the data will go so i'm interested to know if there's any going going to be any work work there I'm also very interested to hear from Ian how he's going to test for standards detection in the data. So, because reuse isn't the license, it's the ability to, to actually understand the data. So that's Thank really you. to Rachel, I think, and Ian. Rachel. In terms of the efforts around the, the burden of cost, um, my only comment on that, Carol, at the moment in terms of the real, you know, honest picture here is we're, we are looking at it and it's extremely hard. Um, and so we're even trying to assess in terms of updating our policies and, and approaches across all of our investments as a funder, how much are we contributing? Um, and also if we are to um, promote broader um, open science practice, where does that um, burden lie. All I can say is um, we are looking at the issue, but it's I, I can't claim in a comprehensive um, fashion at the moment and um, just to say that it's been extremely challenging. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rachel. Uh, I, I actually co-convened a workshop a couple of weeks ago with um, professional technical services staff looking at open research and the way that that's uh, supported by professional technical staff, including obviously research software engineers and data stewards and others. And just the sheer complexity of that picture, it sort of slightly sort of supports your point that it's really hard to get an accurate assessment of 
you know, where the costs are and how the finances flow. Um, Marita, did you want to come in on this question? Yes, I'm responsible for partly for responding to the EOSC monitoring for Finland, and they are actually asking a number of costs related questions. And I'm really interested uh, that's uh, other people in Finland who are responding to that part. And I'm really looking forward to what will be the end result of that exercise. Thanks, Marita. Right. Have I forgotten anybody? Have I missed anybody else in the uh, in the chat with some questions? No. Anybody else? Please raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, this is an immensely prestigious panel. You've got a huge opportunity here to to ask some difficult questions. Ah, Carol. Justin. Yeah, I was going to ask the the absolute killer question actually, which is um, the point of open um, science is to really demonstrate that um, data that we have shared has been uh, reused, and um, all the metrics largely I saw. I may have not uh, entirely um, have, have kept on top of all the presentations. But they seem to be largely about was something shared or was something available. But I didn't see. But was actually was it actually used <laughs> again? So, um, are there any plans in order to be able to develop indicators for things that are actually been used? And if so, how? Oh, Emma, you might want to talk about your phase three at this point, I guess. Um, but others might want to come in as well. Um, yes, I mean this is part of what our phase three plans is about but our phase three plans are very vague at the moment it is just to look at exactly things like that whether data is being reused whether open materials and open access is having more impact because it is um more visible and you know more uh, well distributed so we do have plans for it but i i can't speak to any more detail than that but we we recognize that this is an important aspect of open research Thanks, Emma. Jana. Yes, I can. Uh, I can at least say that the uh, usage side uh, is addressed in the Grasp OS project, where Open Air is leading the development of federated um, infrastructure for data, tools, and services. So, uh, unfortunately, I cannot say uh, technically in how they are planning to do it, but we are investigating different methods and sources for integrating information on that aspect. Good to know. Thanks, Jana. And Ian? Uh, yes, very briefly uh, agree with what Carol is saying in that reuse, you know, is more of the benefit of open open science. And, and that's something we want to see. I think with a lot of these efforts, you know, we, we're often what we're measuring are what we hope to be reasonable proxies and pitch in particular things that are sharing rates are more available more quickly and readily than than things like reuse. But um, you know, I see that we're on a on a journey towards being able to to assess those things as as, as well. Um, and as I've mentioned in the chat, we don't have a concrete plan for how how that would happen. But um, conversations like this, and then starting with with things like looking at availability, I hope that will take us more towards um, uh, measuring also the benefits of open science as well as its prevalence. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ian. And Tim's replied in the chat as well from the data seer perspective. Um, brilliant. OK, uh, in which case, thanks for that killer question, Carol, that, that um, challenged us all. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to, to thank all of our all of our speakers. Thanks to Marita, Jana, to Ian, to Rachel and Emma and to Del and, and to David. Um, and I'm really hoping I haven't forgotten someone there. If so I'm really sorry. Um, and just to finish with, I'd like to remind you of the UKRN call for priorities. Please have a look at the UK Reproducibility Network news page on our website, and that you'll see the links there. Our call for what should institutions be looking for as indicators of open research if they're developing plans to support open research, to monitor its progress, to monitor its impact. Uh, what should institutions be, be using as indicators for those things and why and who would be affected by the use of those indicators? 
So please respond. Please consider responding by the end of April to that that call for prior uh, for priorities. It's going to really inform the work that UKRN is doing uh, in the pilot institutions uh, that we we hope to set up uh, in the next year or so. So thanks very much for that. Thank you very much for attending. It's been fascinating uh, as always, and uh, thanks to our speakers and thanks all to all of you. The recording will be available in about a week and have a good afternoon.